So I thought that Bella Chan from the University of Michigan could talk about character sheets. Hi, everyone. Um, is, is it clear that this microphone is okay? I actually cannot tell it from down here. Um, so um, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for the invitation and also for putting together this fantastic conference. Um, it's a privilege and an honor. Um, so today I want to tell you about um, a, a new, new theory of uh, character sheaves on parahoric subgroups. And these parahoric subgroups are are things that we saw already in Arun's talk. Um, and so these were the Ks, you know, sometimes they look like GLN of O, but then also they, they sometimes look like kind of block diagonal mod, mod T, if you will. Um, and uh, these are of power, paramount importance in the theory of uh, chaotic groups. Um, and uh, and chaotic groups are extremely central objects in, in number theory, especially within the scope of the very massive scope of the Langlands program. And so this is kind of the perspective that I have. And, and so my hope today is to tell you a little bit about the these connections here. Um, so um, I want to say also that this subject um, suddenly rose to um, a new level of fame on September 24, 2021, um, when Apple TV Plus released the first episode of a series called Foundation and they forced millions of everyday people to listen to the words ring of integers of a non-Archimedean local field. <laughs> so now we know that this is an important subject. <laughs> so it has the stamp of approval of Hollywood maybe. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so in this subject, the representation here is finite groups of lead type, which we already saw in uh, John Carlson's talk this morning, uh, plays an extremely central role. It drives a lot of the picture, um, except, uh, and, and, and for me also there are P's and L's. So P's are usually with the finite group of uh, lead type and L's are with the coefficients. Um, but I do the easy case, um, it, uh, I don't do, uh, mod L coefficients, I do something, uh, I do QL bar coefficients. So QL bars uh, is, is uh, some characteristic zero field and um, it's non-canonically isomorphic to C. So really all my representations here are complex representations. Um, and for the most part, they will be complex representations of finite groups. Um, okay, so, so how I want to begin is uh, I'll, I'll show you the main theorem. Um, and, and this theorem is a uh, recent joint work uh, with Roman Bezrukovnikov. Uh, we put the paper up on the archive maybe a, a few months ago. Um, and uh, and so, so uh, basically I'll show you what the main theorem looks like and I'll sp spend the rest of the talk uh, telling you why I want this kind of theorem. Um, so, so here's what the theorem looks like. It says that parabolic induction induces a T exact equivalence of monoidal categories. And these are my monoidal categories. And so these are not just like, the, I mean, this is some, some kind of a small generic part of um, the bounded derived category of G equivariant objects with coefficients in QL bar. It's a bit of a mouthful, but the, this, this uh, I want to think of as something that will give me representation theoretic information. Um, okay, and so so uh, so I have these funny TRs and GRs that we haven't seen before. Let me give you an example of uh, what this is um, in the case SL two. So for SL2, um, I can take TR to simply be the diagonal things inside uh, my GR, which is this funny SL2. So this is kind of neither here nor there based on the stuff that we've seen before. But here, if you take R equals to zero, then that thing is just SL2 over finite field or SL2 over FT bar. Um, so one of these two things. And so this is this is basically what we saw in the first talk, maybe. And and uh, as R goes to infinity, then you'll get uh, the parahorse, the, the K, the compact open that we saw in a Arun's talk. Um, okay, and so this is the kind of picture. So this is, I should think of TR as a kind of torus. It's not literally a torus, it's playing the role of a torus. BR is playing the role of a Burrell, and GR is playing the role of my connected reductive group. This one is not, but um, it's playing such a role. 
Um, and so the fundamental relation of why these things are important um, in, uh, to someone who studies pianic groups is the following basic relation between, um, uh, I guess, fields and rings. And so um, in a loop group setting, you're, uh, you're dealing with the, I guess, um, uh, local function field that's this fp prem prem t inside fp prem prem t the ring of integers of this non archimedean local field is fp with square brackets t um this uh, power series ring and then and then i have a nice quotient to this finite ring and that finite ring is the same thing it's that's a, it's a, that where the sl2 is taking coefficients in um so in the piatic story, and to be honest, I, I abuse notation, both of these things I would call piatic. I recognize that not everyone would do so. And so, uh, uh, so, so in the QP setting, um, uh, the ring of integers of QP is ZP. And once again, I mean, ZP has a unique maximal ideal and I can consider quotients the rings arising as quotients of some powers of this maximal ideal. And so once again, if R is equal to zero, then this ZP mod P is simply uh, FP. So, um, so we begin with a final, uh, let, let me re uh, uh, remind you of the kind of uh, picture of uh, what the representation theory, the complex representation theory of finite groups of Lie type look like. And so let me first explain what happens for SL2 FP. So in this case, if if I take T to be the diagonal, and I take uh, again this this uh, map from B to T by just forgetting the top right hand corner, then given any character of T, I can view it as a character of B by simply pulling back along this map, right? And then once I have this, then I can simply induce this representation of B to a representation of G that I'll call parabolic induction. That's this P end. So the P stands for parabolic, not for my prime P. Um, and the definition of this is simply this functions, this space of functions that have this nice equivariance property with respect to theta and B. Okay. And so um Kind of most of the time, this representation is is um, irreducible. So that is something to keep in mind. So this is producing for me some nice family of irreducible representations of SL two FP. Um, so there's another way to view this, um, uh, an equivalent way, which is now notice if you have a function here, like uh, over here. Oh, I have this one. Um, if I have a function that satisfies this here, now my projection map forgets what's in the top right corner. So that means that a function uh, living inside this space over here is going to be uh, descend to a function on G mod U. Did something happen here? My voice suddenly, dead battery with an exclamation point. Um, yeah. This is a rapid change. This is like, um, you know, like a formula, formula one race car race. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, and so, so this is, uh, so any function inside this space will, inside this space over here will, will descend to a function on G mod U. Um, so, so now I have this G mod U object. So G mod U is very nice. Um, there's a left action by G. And there's a, also a right action by T, and that's because T normalizes U. Um, and anytime we have an action like this, it means that I have an action on the function space of this thing. So this is just a finite set. My G is SL2 FP, my U is up, upper triangular unipotent things in FP. So that's just like a one dimensional vector space over FP. So I can put this uh, C here now, or a QL bar if you wish. Um, and, and so now I have this representation that's, uh, that has these two actions. And the game is that, um, that representations of G are hard, but representations of T are easy. So if I'm given this, uh, this character of theta of T, I can look inside this function space um, for, the, for the part where T acts by theta. So I'm gonna call this, uh, I'm gonna denote this with this uh, subscript um, theta, and this is the theta eigenspace of this function space. I'm gonna define this to be this RTG theta. So this is a parabolic induction in this case. Okay, so something that, funny that happens in uh, for SL2 uh, FP that we haven't really seen in, in previous talks is that uh, because SL2 FP, or because FP is not algebraically closed, there are two 
tori inside SL2FP. There's this one, and there's a funny one that doesn't look like a torus. And so, so here's the one that doesn't look like a torus. It's called T prime. Um, and it, it, it okay, so it doesn't look diagonal, for example. But if you go to FP squared, this will become diagonal. So it's uh, it's okay. So um, let me just write here. I, I meant to write here. This thing is isomorphic to the kernel of the norm map from FP squared star to FP star. So, so, and so this one you can view as this is p plus one to roots of unity. And so, so, so what's the what's the deal? So over here, I built some irreducible representations of, of G, but in fact, these are not all the irreducible representations of G. These are roughly half of them, and the other half of them are parameterized by characters of T prime. Um, and so what does this look like? Well, instead of doing something uh, uh, zero dimensional where I take functions on G mod U, I'm going to build something that has dimension now. Instead of G mod U, I'm going to uh, write down what's called a Drenfeld's curve. And this is the first example of, what, of what's called a delian lucid variety. Um, okay, so that's, uh, and, and so this is some definite, it's some nice curve. Um, and uh, there's a left action just by matrix multiplication, and there's a right action by this thing that I called, remember, I called it mu p plus one, and that's just by scaling x and y simultaneously. So yeah, again, like in the g mod u case, you have these two commuting actions, one by g and one by your, uh, your torus, which in this case is this t prime. <laughs> And so I can again do this thing. I take the notion of like functions on this space and I consider some theta isotopic component. Um, but here, uh, uh, the, the role of functions will be replaced by a cohomology group or a, 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 a all cohomology groups. And so this is what it looks like. Um, and it's the same thing because X had some actions, the cohomology group, which are now C vector spaces, if you will, also endowed these actions uh, have have endowed these actions, and so similarly in the same in the way that we defined R T G theta, we can do the same thing for for this T prime, and so I'll define R T prime G theta to be this thing here. Okay. Okay. So um. So uh. So what's going on here? What's going on is that inside G, we have these two uh, maximal tori, T and T prime, and each of them contributed some irreducible representation. So it turns out that these are the remaining representations of SL2FP that we didn't get from T. Um, and this picture holds in general. So this is this is um, called the Lean-Lustig theory after um, um, original paper in 1976. This is the beginning of the story of representations of uh, finite groups of Lie type complex representations. And this is the picture. You have a T and you have a theta and you have something called the RTG theta. And that's how you get uh, these representations. And so I wrote down here um, at the bottom uh, 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 what we saw on the previous slides for SL2. Other questions? Okay, so the point of this talk that I uh, hope to convey is that these things that you know of uh, over FQ can also be done over this truncated polynomial, right? FQ adjoin T quotient out, out by T to the R plus one. And so I'll call them delin lustig theory for paraboric subgroups. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit about this. So first, let me define um, uh, what's uh, called a jet scheme. So this is actually, this has nothing to do with G. This is a general thing. You can take a, 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 like a, a scheme over FQ um, and you can define the jet scheme to be the, the scheme that takes, that, that takes in some FQ algebra A and spits out like uh, the, the points over this uh, fattened A. Um, Okay, and so uh, for if you take G to be SL2, then you will get this SL2 of this uh, truncated polynomial ring that I wrote down on the um, first slide. Okay, and so you can do this, as I said, it's a general thing. You can do this for G, but you can also do it for B. And when you do it for B and you also do it for T and you also do it for U, where U is the unipotent radical of B, you get, again, this thing that looks like a Levy decomposition. Uh, BR is equal to TR times UR. Okay, and so... What it turns out that you can do is that you can do the same kind of delin lustig variety uh, uh, construction over over this in in this context now, and um, and so this was defined uh, by lustig in um, 
in in maybe I don't remember, but maybe 2009 or so. Um, and uh, and then and then it was generalized to a mixed characteristic setting um, by uh, Alexander Stasinski. Um, and then this was considered by myself and my collaborator Alexander Ivanov in a context that um, uh, one needs to study representations of chaotic groups. So I'll say a little bit about that in in maybe one or two slides. Sigma yeah. Say. So, oh, good question. Sigma is Frobenius or Steinberg. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so, uh, in order to get T, I would just take the like for SL two. I can just take the standard Frobenius, where I take like A B C D goes to A to the P, B to the P, and so forth. But to get T prime, I actually do something funny to Sigma. I can conjugate this Sigma by the non-trivial element inside the vial group for SL two. Um, so, so that so one can actually compute what these things are explicitly and see that you recover the SL two equations that I got on the previous slide. Well, the, the T's are sigma stable. Yes, very good. Yes, good question. However, the U is not. Um, okay, and so in the same way, uh, same spirit as before, I can define an RTG theta, but now there are R's floating around as well. Okay, so. Um, oh, wait, hang on. I made an error in, oh, so this is again, hang on, okay. Um, I'm in an error in <laughs> not deleting some, some slides. Okay, um, so, um, so the, I mentioned that, uh, I, I mean, I'm interested in pietic groups. And so actually the context, you, you wanna consider a, actually a more general uh, class of algebraic groups. And these are the ones that come from from parahoric subgroups associated to the piatic group. And so the structure of this, I'm just gonna say this, it's not relevant for the talk, is, is um, that associated to a piatic group, uh, you have a building, a Guhat Heats building. And so to every point inside that building, you can consider an associated parahoric. And this uh, parahoric has an associated filtration, like congruent subgroups. And this is called the moi facade filtration. And so the things that I want to consider are actually things that don't necessarily come from a uh, connected reductive G, but uh, appear in this way. And so uh, the basic example is that Iwahori will not come as a GR, a, a jet scheme of a connected reductive thing, but it will lie in this class of algebraic groups that I've uh, indicated in this parentheses. Okay. So now I've kind of talked a lot about like the, uh, that these things are important in representations of piatic groups. Let me tell you about the uh, basic case where, where this appears. And so uh, the representation theory of piatic groups is, uh, I mean, kind of not understood, but the, uh, the, the thing that I want to tell you is that there's kind of um, a, a most important basic class of irreducible representations of piatic groups. And these are called uh, supercuspidal representations. They're not called, uh, I mean, I don't mean basic that they're easy. They're basic in that, in theory, you can build everything out of uh, these supercuspidal. So they're they're um, basic in this sense. Um, and so let me tell you for, for the loop group of SL2, what a supercuspidal looks like. And so it's a recipe that only requires three steps and two of the steps are easy. So actually it's only kind of one step. And this one step is a, is a finite field set. It's a finite groups step. So the first thing is to consider RT prime G theta. So uh, a comment is that you really genuinely want the T prime one here. If you do the uh, T one, this, uh, but you can run steps one, two, and three. However, the resulting re representation you uh, obtain in step three will not be irreducible. So that's not the kind of, that's, that won't give you a super cuspidal. So when you do this funny T prime guy and you consider this representation and you view it now as a representation of the compact open that we saw in the previous talk uh, by, by uh, inflating along the natural map that goes like this, right, the t goes to zero map. Um, and then I take the compact induction, which is some like uh, more controlled version of induction. Uh, the statement is that this, uh, this representation is irreducible. And anytime you have an irreducible representation that comes in a recipe of this shape, it's automatically super -cuspital. So it's really a question about irreducibility here. Um, and uh, so, so this was, uh, this is work of um, uh, Morris and independently of uh, Moy and Prasad. Um, um, 
maybe in the in, in the early 90s, um, maybe slightly before this. Okay, so given that I've to told you about this, and then I've also flip flop between the R setting, one natural thing that you could, uh, the most natural thing that you can ask is, can you get the depth R bigger than zero? So, I mean, I have this zero over here, right? So this zero is indicated, but like R equals zero is depth R. Can you get positive depth by inserting R everywhere you see it? Yeah, I, there's a question here, yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. You just take the area. Just, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so, so this is this is a this is a question, and um, and the answer is yes. So this is very good. So now we're happy. Um, and so and so this this box is in orange because uh, another orange box will come in at the end. Um, and so you should keep this in mind for this. <laughs> Okay, and uh, but but the truth of the like this affirmative act uh, answer is 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 actually uh, uh, is the result of of many years of work. So so it kind of looks like everything was done in three years, but I mean it's like the usual thing of like the papers taking some time to get published. So and in some of the first uh, the first work uh, we were doing in 2018 2019, the second work we were doing in. Uh, between 2019 and 2021 and then and then the last thing there um yeah actually is something that I've been thinking about for many years and I uh, put up a paper on the archive um like maybe two or three weeks ago so that's the 2020 yeah. um so uh what I want to tell you a little bit about is how this middle step uh the the, the second one is and the um, uh, and I'll kind of ignore the first and the third input so the second input is um a, uh, is a comparison between two worlds a world of algebra and a world of geometry so this is algebra and geometry um what is okay <laughs> already um so uh so so the represents constructing super hospitals of uh, uh piatic groups has a really long history um, maybe starting in the 50s or 60s uh, with specific groups, you know, first to GL2. So GL2 turns out to be uh, easier than SL2. Um, you can ask me later why that is. Um, and, and then this, uh, then you could do GLN and then you could do division algebras and then you could do classical groups. And um, uh, the first, uh, 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 and then there's also Sheridan should be on this list as well. Um, uh, that, um, and I don't remember what year, maybe 1980s or so. Um, um, and, um, and, and, and uh, the names here are kind of the first uh, uh, constructions of representations of chaotic groups that works like for any G, any connected reductive group G over uh, non archimedean local fields. Um, and uh, to the, uh, right now, the state of the art is that we know that use construction uh, by work of uh, Jessica Pinson, uh, Julie Kim and Jessica Pinson uh, at two separate times in two separate uh, uh, generalities, um, uh, we know that these basically give us all the supercuspitals. And so, in fact, the algebraic story knows about these supercuspitals. And so the natural question is, well, but, uh, 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 on the previous slide, I told you about some geometric way to get uh, supercuspitals. How does that compare to this? And so that's the content of this work with Masao Oi, is that one can actually compare this representation uh, that came from the cohomology of something to, to this algebraic construction. And this algebraic construction, I should say, it's quite subtle. It, uh, half the time, it's kind of easy, and half the time, not really half the time, it's like, it's like a inductive thing and at each step half the time. So like in order for it to be actually easy, you'd have to be like half times, half times, half times, half, which is like much smaller than half. Um, and and so, so then we have a comparison statement. The, the statement says the geometric side is isomorphic to the algebraic side. So the first thing is actually the, this, uh, this is not true. Um, one has to put in uh, an additional character. So this is in fact not true on the nose. The comparison doesn't work on the nose. Uh, you have to add in an additional character and this is a correction term. Um, so this, this additional character is actually only, it's valued in plus or minus one. So representation theoretically, this is like the easiest kind of character ever. But, but in fact, this correction term has caused a lot of grief for the last um, uh, like 30 years. Um, and so the reason is that uh, 
there are uh, Langland's theoretic reasons um, for one to require this correction term here. If you don't have this correction term, there's a bunch of stuff in Langland that breaks. It's not the correct parameterization. And so, so, so there's kind of two conclusions from this. The first is like an isomorphism like this first tells you that the things that you're, it, it gives you the answer yes to the, the orange, uh, it gives you the orange box, the orange yes. Um, but in fact, the other thing is that it, it tells you that the, that this, um, that this, uh, that the geometry is picking up the correct uh, 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 normalization from the perspective of arithmetic. And so this thing knows about really deep and really difficult uh, arithmetic properties um, uh, that somehow uh, had to be manually detected on the algebraic side. And so this is something that uh, made me extremely excited. Okay. So, um, so now what does this have to do with character sheets, right? So, so let me, let me say something about this. Oh, I see. I think I uh, mildly edited something. I'm, okay. Don't look. Okay. There. <laughs> okay. So, so here's a, a, a classical theory of character sheets by Lustig in the 1980s. And um and and let let me explain um uh the maybe the first pass of of this theory um in in what I view as a, like a very elementary way so so we have this parabolic induction that I defined uh, very early on and in in representation theory one oh one you learn what the uh, what the character of this is right it's a class function it's a class function given by this extremely explicit formula okay and so. What kind of thing do you want to do in character sheets? You might ask, is there a sheaf version of this representation? Um, and, and, and the answer is uh, yes. And um, the passage between uh, this sheaf thing and this character, uh, this class function is, uh, uh, is something called, called the sheaf's to functions correspondence. It's uh, given by taking a, the trace of Frobenius in some appropriate way. Um, and so, and, and, uh, and the associated sheaf is this thing that looks a bit scary, but it's not scary. So, so uh, here's the thing. Under this sheaf, the functions correspondence, natural things that you might do in the world of geometry correspond to natural things that you might do to a function. So if you take a, a pullback, okay. So the first thing is that there's some, some sheafy way to, uh, to, to, um, to, to, to capture the, uh, the information of this character theta. Um, but also, okay, what's a natural thing you could do? You could take a pullback. This pullback is the same as taking this uh, projection map over here. And what is this push forward over here? This push forward is the same as taking an average. And so, so that's how all of these things correspond. And you'll notice whatever, like how did I write down, how would you write down this upper space right here? The way you would write down this upper space is by constructing some object where, there's a map to G and the fibers of this map to G are exactly these things, right? And what is this? This is exactly this, um, this indexing thing here. Okay. So this is RTG thing. What about RT prime G? And so, so the magic of this, and this is uh, um, um, in this form is a theorem of Lustig, it, um, is, is that first this, this push forward, this object on the right-hand side is a really nice object. It's a perverse sheaf. It's the first example of uh, a character sheaf. And moreover, if you take the sheaf, uh, the function corresponding to the sheaf, actually you get RTG theta. But in fact, you also get RT prime G theta. So you, like uh, it's like for any T, you always get RT G theta. So you have this beautiful thing where the rep you have this representation theory side, there's a trace to the middle, and then there's the sheep side, there's a trace to the middle, and everything commutes. Okay. So let uh, let me um uh so so uh character sheaves in general have gone through um a few iterations. So so the previous page was character sheaves of connected reductive groups. And then um in the early 2000s, uh Lustig conjectured the existence of a theory of character sheaves for two other classes of groups. The first being uh unipotent groups, which is kind of like the opposite of being reductive. Um and this was solved by uh Boritenko and Drinfeld in the two 2010s. Um 
And then the other uh, class of uh, or the other conjectured um, theory of character shapes was on these uh, parahoric subgroups that I've been talking about, these GRs, in fact. So the theorem, uh, the, the conjecture of blue stick is the following thing, is that on the previous slide, I had this funny picture, but actually you can put Rs everywhere. Just put Rs everywhere, like a, you've seen an R. Um, and then there's a natural question to ask is uh, whether the, the uh, corresponding push forward is also perverse. So this is conjecture. And blue stick proved this for, um, R equals one and R equals three um, and kind of halfway for R equals two and no other cases. Um, and basically the, the technique was, it, it became too computationally difficult. Um, and and so, so the main theorem that I showed you at the beginning is a positive resolution to this. So the main theorem on a slide one implies that this theorem is true. Um, for, every for, e oh, for every R, for arbitrary R, yeah, well, and and yeah. also for not uh, arbi arbitrary G, and and not uh, like not even for not just the jet schemes, but also for anything arising in this uh this quotient of of the parahoric by a uh, uh, more fil uh, precise filtration subgroup, and moreover, uh, if you take trace of Frobenius of this uh sheaf that you now know is perverse, you you recover this R T this R version of R T G theta. Um, so uh, technically that wasn't part of the uh, Lucix conjecture, but I think that's just because this RTR GR theta thing, like, uh, what do you call it? Like post dated, post, I don't know if that's a word, post dated uh, this conjecture. So, so I think it's a very, yeah. But moreover, what we prove is that in fact, you can replace all these T's by L's. So you can replace all the tori, that's the T, by levies, that's the L. Um, and so that means like instead of diagonal, you can take block diagonal. Um, and, uh, and, and so the proof is, is what I said before, is that one has a T exact equivalence of categories. And so what that means is, uh, where's my pen, is that uh, it means that uh, uh, perverse things in here get mapped to perverse things here. If you had a simple perverse thing over here, it would get mapped to a simple perverse thing over here. Okay. And given this plus the orange box before, what this actually tells us is that geometrically used construction, with, which algebraically is very difficult and sometimes does this, you know, at each step has this difficult process. Actually, in terms of geometry, this is very simple. It's just each step you do parabolic construction. Okay, so um, uh, thank you for allowing me to go over time. I have one picture that I want to end on. So here is a box. Um, this box is a picture of GR, and the way it's a picture of GR is that I think of uh, GR, a GR has some roots, like in the same level, you know, a root system, yeah, and so, so this, how wide this box is depends on how many roots you have, and how, um, what is this dimension called? Deep, let's call it deep. How deep this box is depends on the depth of, um, and so, so that's, that, this is GR. So what is something that you can do with the theorem now? The theorem says that uh, what you can do, okay, so at the top is depth R. That's, uh, at the top is where Lustig's theory of character shapes or connected reductive groups lies. So say I take a, 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 um, a levy, um, and at depth R, that's gonna be a connected reductive group. That means that at this top part here, I can, I can say specify the character shape of your choice, okay? So I'm going to build for you from this, a character sheaf on a, a nice perverse sheaf that I think should be called a character sheaf um, on this box here. And so what I'm gonna do is I take this thing and I'm gonna tensor it by some multiplicative local system, which um, puts me inside this generic subcategory that allows me to perform my induction. And so that thing gives me depth. So I started at the top and then I became deep. <laughs> Yeah, okay, and the induction is something like from T to G, right? If you go from T to D, T has no roots. And so when you go to T to G, it becomes wider. So that's what happens. I apply the theorem about this equivalence and I become wider, yeah? And I can repeat this now. I tensor by something that puts me in the generic sub uh, subcategory of the appropriate thing. And then I apply induction, I apply this induction, which is an equivalence of categories. And I keep doing this, right? Tensor, induce tensor and then induce. So I stop here. Thank you very much.
Any questions? So, yes. The basic idea is to extend the linguistic theory to this very non reductive way. That's correct. Yes. Is that, is that the basic? That is the basic idea. Yes. So, GR yes. has a very big. Really exactly. Yes, this is like a gluing between yeah. the the reductive thing uh, theory and the and the unipotent thing. But I don't know how to see this. So so yeah. And you you are treating the presentation of GR. Yes. Just like an abstract finite group. Yes. Is that how? It, yes. Exactly. That? So if I understand, uh, if I build enough interesting representations of this GR, I can then build. Uh, the the interesting representations of the PN group that I'm interested in, and yeah, so that's exactly the point. Is that like what's my target? My target is to prove stuff about the in the Langlands uh, 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 program, and that's about PN groups. And I'm going to do that by first just doing everything at the finite step, and then everything else is like the compact induction. That step is easy. So yeah. But when you take the limit guys. So this construction is not very, very compatible with limits. That's right? a very good question. So the question is, what happens when you vary R? Right. Um, exactly. And so actually, uh, in in oh my gosh, there's no way that I'm going to be able to get back. Okay, I just uh, so uh, so in the T prime case, in this uh, elliptic case, if you take an elliptic torus, in fact, all of these R's are compatible. And so this is something that I can prove. It it was difficult to prove um, that. If you take the information that comes from RTRGR, it's the same as the information coming from RTR plus one, GR plus one, if your character came from the lower level. Uh, and so what this means is that you can genuinely take an inverse limit over all Rs and build this, this infinite dimensional thing now that Newton knows about like smooth objects, uh, this infinite dimensional thing that's lived, that's coming from the data of these uh, compact open subgroups of uh, of pianic groups. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, very good well, question. But it's only coming from the lower group, lower bar. So everything, so in representations of pianic groups, like if you don't put any adjectives, this is an unwieldy problem. And so we always put a smoothness assumption. Right. And the smoothness means that I'm allowed to choose this R. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Buddy. Yeah, thank you. Maybe one or two more, and then we'll go to the question. Yes, Jerome has said that the GR is a very large one, normal. Yes. Yes. And uh, so, as far as for the finite group of conditions, I mean, mostly that's true. Who will be able to do it? Because that's going to kind of our labor group here, which is the group of 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 the group so the question is that this kind of linguistic new characters you get. Yes. How far is it known as all categories for characters? I think this is really difficult. Um, so I think in general, uh like uh trying to understand the like trying to classify the irreducible representations of GR is uh is really difficult. And sort of um uh I don't need to do this. I'm ca I care about the pianic group. So I kind of only want enough uh, uh, on GR. So I'm not getting all the irreducible representations of GR, um, but I don't mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mean, certainly there are irreducible representations of GR that are not are non isomorphic on GR, but will become conjugate after you take a compact induction to the pianic group. And so sort of, I don't need, I'm not really, uh, well, maybe in the future, I would like to understand this, but so uh, sort of my my goal right now is really, uh, is, is like just having one of them is, is enough uh, in like a GFQP orbit of, of all possibilities, yeah. Okay, uh, my second question is that still with the, the marginal importance so long as sort of group unit, and the important part of it, the um, character shifts were described by uh, yes, Twinkle and uh, or Tenko, uh, correct. And so, how does this linguistic reduction? Yeah, is compatible it's a great question, and it's something that I uh, it, it is on my list. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I think the. Uh, 
like ultimately what should the shape of the theory look like? The shape of the sh theory sh would, should be that we can see the way in which the unipotent, I mean, like, as you say, like uh, if, you, uh, if you truncate right after the reductive part, you get some big uh, unipotent thing. That thing has character sheets, right? We know what the character sheets of that look like. So how are they gluing with the depth zero part? Um, this is a picture that, that uh, ought to be resolved. Um, I, I have not gotten around to thinking about it at the end. Yeah, thank you very much, yeah. But I was looking at the yeah. in cases five, it's still going to go through the box. So Sorry, say again? Talking science five, it's cases. Um, it's going to go through the box, so it's probably more complex than this. Sorry, can you? Uh, uh, almost in the talking plan, it's a part of the um, Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see, I <laughs> see. Yeah. Do you get information about hacker algebras and positive depth sort of independently from about presentations from this? I think you should. Um, uh, but I, I don't have experience uh, uh, in this direction. So, but I, I think I think you should. And and um, yeah, recently I started thinking about uh, uh, questions of this um, this type, like uh, like uh, geometrically, you know, like uh, I mean, this stuff should be really. I mean, this is it should be closely related to Hecke categories, for example. And so, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think there's a close relation. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, this new construction of super hospitals, uh, it's only known to be exhausted up to some famous position. Yes. Uh, can you get around this using your geometric construction? Yeah, this is a great question. Thank you very much. So, so the first thing is that um, I will. At present, my construction cannot get all uh, supercustodes that you get. However, my construction gets some that you does not get. And it's exactly the So use construction, I, I said like at each stage, half the time it's hard. And the reason, the hardness is because you have to use a Bay representation. And as we know from like, if you've ever done something about Bay representation, the first thing you have to say is key is not two. Um, however, my stuff it, it works for. I mean, it doesn't. The geometry doesn't care about what p is, and and so in fact, uh, and at least uh, yeah. So so like already anything that came from this for p plus two is new. It didn't come from used construction. Um, but uh, for for other characteristics, in fact, there are also new representations here. So you have some some other assumptions as well that that cuts down on. Um, on, uh, I mean, that prevents uh, the, the construction from being exhausted for all primes P, and there are new ones um, in, in, this, in this setting as well. So there's some generosity cons uh, constraint that I kind of only need half of, that you need like double of. <laughs> I'm happy to say more, uh, yeah. Thank you.